Thank you, Javier. That was very good. I'm going to have to speak to my friends and family about being a little bit too honest with you and too open with the pictures for sure. So I, I, I want to talk um, this morning about the association. I want to talk specifically about some of the things the association has been doing in the last four or five years and then um, finish with what I think the, where the association I think needs to put some of its energy going forward in the next few years. To do that, I really have to talk about um, the members and the people that make up the committees that have been doing the things that we've been doing because the reason that the association is, is so special is because of the membership and the engagement of the membership. Yeah, no, for some reason it's not. Uh... Okay, there we go. Um, so, as Javier mentioned, I just finished a, a year as president of the Canadian Association of General Surgeons. Um, and it, it, it was somewhat overlapping with this year, which was a good and a bad thing. It was very busy, but it was good in that it provided some juxtaposition um, so that I could compare the differences between the two organizations. And in a lot of ways, they're similar. Similar. Uh, size, around a thousand members, um, similar number of committees, one year presidential terms, so a lot of things the same, but there was a lot of differences and re really um, I think that more than anything made me appreciate how special this association is. The, um, the, the Canadian Association of General Surgeons I think is like a lot of other associations and surgical associations which is represented by this this transport tanker which you know, it, it, it has a lot of stuff on it, has a lot of people in it, um, gets going in a direction, takes a while to get up to speed, and then um, is not easy to change direction. It takes a lot of planning, a lot of time, and a lot of effort uh, to change directions. And the last year, in the last four or five years, you know, on council and as an officer has really taught me and showed me that this association is not at all like that. We're able to pivot and change direction and do things very quickly um, because of the membership and the engagement of the membership. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that. I'd like to... Um, okay. I'd like to uh, be indulged for a minute and thank a few people that are important to me. Um, I'd like to thank Dr. Janice Pasika and um, some of Javier's stories I can tell came from Dr. Pasika. Um, she, she was the, uh, the biopsy liver tumor when I was a chief resident where I went and uh, had a nice leisurely lunch and she took care of the patient. Um, Jan has been the citywide division head uh, for the whole time that I was a resident. She helped me get my fellowship, helped me arrange my graduate degree, paid for my graduate degree, then hired me back to the University of Calgary, um, and subsequently has become um, a mentor and a colleague, and, and really, I think is fair to say, has been one of my strongest supporters through my career, and I owe a huge amount to her. So I, I want to thank her, and she's uh, made, made the long trip here and is here in the audience, so thank you. I have to thank... I have to thank my three partners. This year's been very, very busy. Um, as all of you know, HPB surgery doesn't lend itself well to doing operations and then leaving town. Um, and I left town a lot this past year and was not around. So Francis Sutherland, Chad Ball, and Oliver Bathe looked after my patients, looked after my practice when I was gone. I'm sure they felt like complaining about it, but they never complained. They, they were great, so I really want to thank them for all the help in the past year. Within the association and just within the HPB community, and, and again, Javier sort of touched on this, I really owe thanks to um, Nick Vothe and Vil Jarnigan. Um, they've both been uh, excellent um, supporters and mentors for me. It started on the research committee where I was a member on that committee, and then I was co-chair with Nick, and then uh, chair, and then came on to council and, and was an officer with both Nick and Bill. And they both have, have always, um, you know, given me great advice and I know uh, have supported me um, throughout, throughout my time in the association. So I want to thank both of them very much for, for all their help and support. 
Two years ago, the, the officers realized that we had to change management companies, and um, there was a lot of angst and anxiety about, about doing that. Um, I felt bad for Will Chapman because Will, uh, his presidential term, when he took over, we had just changed management companies, so a lot of anxiety about how things were going to go and how the meeting was going to be. And I think it's fair to say that it was, it was seamless, and the meeting last year went off without a hitch. And this year, um, it's been even better. I mean, LP has, has truly been amazing. The attention to detail, and not just attention to detail a month or two before the meeting, attention to detail all the time, throughout the whole year, um, has really helped us, uh, I think, take it to the next level and is really going to make a huge difference for the association going forward. So I want to thank Noni and her team for, for everything that they do. And then last but not least is Paul Gregg. Paul was my uh, fellowship director when I was in Toronto, and Paul's a great surgeon. I learned lots of surgery from Paul. But I think more than anything, just the way that Paul conducts himself and leads his life um, and, and has remained a very good friend and, and a great confidant, both, both in terms of academic career advice but just life advice, Paul's, um, uh, I consider, again, one, one, of my, one of my mentors, and I want to thank Paul for everything that he's done for me throughout the years. So back to the association, as, as you know, um, the association was formed in 1994. From 94 to 97, uh, they did not have a standalone meeting. They had a meeting in conjunction or at AASLD for one day. 1997 was the first year that we had our own standalone meeting, and, and the meetings were every other year back then, so not every year up until 2005. As I mentioned uh, when, I, when I introduced Wright, Finances were a huge issue. Uh, it was a, sh a shoestring budget where they were always worried that if things went wrong, they'd be bankrupt. And, and over that time period, from 97 to 2005, the, the people that ran the organization were the presidents, and many of them are here now, really p built the foundations for where we are here today and, 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 and made us into, into a strong, well-built, well with a great foundation organization. It, when, when we were in the lead up to the uh, World Congress in Buenos Aires in 2010, Mark Callery was the president, and we had a, a one-day retreat uh, to talk about going global and expanding and looking outside of North America, because we were largely a North American association at that time, the U.S. and Canada. So Mark had us, uh, sent everyone this book, The World is Flat, by Thomas Friedman, and had all of us uh, read it in advance as homework. And then uh, we met and talked about how we could start to look outside um, the association as a, as a North American association and, and think globally and think about representing the Americas and not just North America. And at the time, I, I, I think that, that, that people sort of wondered where this was going to go and, and, and why we were doing it. Um, it, seems like, it seems obvious to us now, but at the time it was a big deal and Mark was visionary at that time. And, I, and really, um, that was a change in direction for the association. We, we did a bunch of things to um, really engage uh, South America, Latin America, and, and, and have really uh, changed the face of the organization to what it is today. So I want to give credit to Mark for, for, for the foresight to do that. We changed... We changed our name, that's the, the, the first thing, which was a big deal. We changed it from the American HPB Association to the America's HPB Association, which, uh, although symbolic, I think really represented the, the, the change in, in the leadership of the organization. We did, a, we did not hold our meeting uh, the year of the World Congress in Buenos Aires, so we um, all went down to Buenos Aires and didn't have a standalone meeting and really supported that meeting. And I think that that was the sort of the well, returning the page as a new chapter um, in the association, and and really started to engage in in South America. You can see here uh, from our membership how things have changed. You look at 2007, 2008, we were bouncing around 600 members, and from 2008 onwards, we've had a steady incline in membership that keeps getting steeper and steeper. There's been three chairs of the membership committee during that time. 
uh, Chuck Vollmer, Tim Pollock, and Felipe Coimbra, and all three of them have done different initiatives to, to get new members, um, both within North America, so maximize our membership in North America, but also engaging in, in Latin America, and you can see the, the, uh, the dotted line at the bottom that we've had a real significant improvement in the numbers of, of members from Latin America o over the past few years. So from 2008, where we had 600 members, we've more than doubled. We're now um, up to over 1,300 members and continue to rise. This last year, as, as, as I mentioned, the most up-to-date numbers are that we have 172 new members this year, so more than a 10% increase in our membership. We've, we've gone from 48 Latin American members in 2010 to 238 now um, th this, this past year. So it's truly a, an amazing transformation in the membership of the organization. The membership committee was part of the reason for that, but the other, the other um, big reason, and, and again can't be underestimated, is the work that my good friend Javier Landoir has done um, with chapter development. Every chapter development requires a ton of work, especially locally within the chapter, but none of it would have been possible without Javier. Javier has been the contact person for all the new chapters. Javier has helped develop the uh, bylaws and helped write the bylaws for these new chapters, has it interpreted from English to, to Spanish, and has really been the glue uh, that's, that's made that all stick together and work. He's traveled more than anyone that I know in the past five years. Um, and if you, if you I'll, I'll bring up a map in a second, you'll see all the places that he's traveled to. So in the past year, we have three new chapters, Bolivia, Peru, Paraguay, with Presidents Renan Antello, Victor Torres Cueva, and Castor Sarmanego. And if you look at the map of South America, the blue are places that we have chapters. And we, we basically had no chapters back in 2008, 2009. And, and really because of uh, Javier's hard work, you can see that we've almost filled in the whole uh, South American continent. And now we're, we're moving and, and starting to work on uh, in Central, Central America. So um, really um, transformational change in the past five years, which is really a, a, an astounding thing and, a, and is in large thanks to, to Javier. We, we met with all the chapter presidents uh, in the spring last year uh, in Buenos Aires, and you can see here that, that they all showed up. All of them were happy to be there, very engaged, talked about um, what was important to them, and what, what, what we could do for them, and what sort of initiatives they were interested in. Both myself and Javier were there, but you can also see that the uh, president and president-elect of the IHPBA were there as well, Jagannath and Oscar, which, which uh, again, is, 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 I think, fairly uh, unique and new in that we were very much um, trying to do this together and not in competition. Because of the, the nature of membership fees, not, 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 be, not on purpose, but just because of the cost, in general, we've been in competition with each other trying to get new members uh, when we open these new chapters. It's expensive to, to get dual membership, and so most people would rather choose to be a member of one or the other. So we've been working on um, a number of collaborations uh, with the IHPBA. You can see that myself and uh, Jagannath have spent a fair bit of time with Oscar and Javier. Oscar and Javier, for those of you that don't know, are partners, and they're kind of like brothers. They're they get along great most of the time, sometimes they fight, but very, very good close friends. And I think it's fair to say that all four of us have become very good close friends over the past, uh, over the past year. We've worked on a, a number of things to try and uh, streamline things for, for people. The first is that we've gone to um, a common online payment system using the same system to, to simplify payments so that people don't have to go to two different websites pay on two different websites, then try and, try and reconcile it between the organizations. So just in the past year, we've agreed on, uh, on, on a new uh, vendor that we're both going to use and should make it much, much more um, uh, seamless and, and reconciliation very easy. We've again uh, agreed not to hold uh, a standalone Congress next year. We're, we're, our meeting is going to be in conjunction with the World Congress in Sao Paulo which is going to be an awesome Congress and I think uh, all of you should, should go to. And then the, I think third and most important is that we've been working on trying to harmonize the membership fees so that instead of paying two separate fees, um, you'd be able to pay a single fee, which would make sense, 
and would give you membership in, in both organizations and would, would make it so that um, we're not in competition anymore, but that we're always in collaboration. And I think that in the next three or four months, this should happen. And, and I think it's going to, again, be um, transformational for the organization and for the membership. I think that our membership is going gonna, is gonna <coughs> to dramatically increase. And then, and then last but not least, um, you know, we want to start working together with the IHPBA on, on, uh, on initiatives and, and cooperative outreach medical missions. And the first one of those is going to be uh, this year in Bolivia. Um, so in June, uh, myself, Oscar, and Javier are going to are going to travel to Bolivia as a combined I and HPBA uh, medical outreach. You can't talk about medical outreach uh, in our association without talking about Ghazi Zabari. For those of you that that don't know Ghazi, Ghazi is a transplant surgeon and an HPB surgeon. And as much as he is a transplant and HPV surgeon, I would say that he's a humanitarian outreach surgeon. It's um, not a hobby for him. It's a full-time activity. Ghazi's been going back to his, uh, his home uh, land and country of uh, Kurdistan and Iraq for the past 20 years. And what he's done there in terms of uh, building infrastructure and training and, and changing their health system is astounding. And he's brought that passion um, to the AHPBA. He's really sort of fostered um, and, and fomented um, a belief in the importance of medical outreach. And, and I think in large part because of him and his work on the International Relations Committee, we've um, in the last four or five years really gotten into uh, medical outreach. When Nick Vote was president, Nick asked all of the officers to, to pick somewhere to go and to arrange um, a medical outreach mission, and we all did that. And, and every year since then, we've done it. And every year, it's expanded. More people have come. We've done different things. In, so, in some places, you, you're you're doing more teaching than anything, building infrastructure. Every trip is 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 better and more because you've been there before and you know what they need and you've developed a relationship with the people. Um, and sometimes it's surgery, teaching how to do surgery, doing complex surgery. So it's a, it's a broad spectrum that we do. And I would encourage anyone that's interested in getting involved to get involved. Um, Sean Cleary is now the chair of that committee. And you could talk to Sean or Ghazi and they'd, be, they'd, they'd love to have you uh, as part of that. I can't go over the work that all the committees are doing. They're all amazingly active. And, and, and um, this is probably the biggest difference that I noticed between the HPBA and CAGS. Not that CAGS uh, isn't a great organization, but the amount of involvement and engagement on these committees. I mean, Tim Pollock's been leading publications. Tim has done great work uh, on the website, on social media. Um, he's, he's changed things w in, in terms of our relationship with our journal, HPB, I think for the better. Development, Scott, um, Helton was probably the first example of a president that's done more work after he was done his presidential term. And I think Bill Jarnigan's on his way to being the second person that's done more work after his presidential term. Uh, the amount of work that he's done in the past year in development has been truly astounding. Magella Doyle with innovation. And then uh, Rebecca Minner, Paul, Paul Hansen, Tara Kent, and Rohan J. Raja, the amount that they've done in education, um, putting together a consensus conference on education this past year, work on educational models, the online blog, credentialing around our fellowships is, again, astounding. You could spend a, a whole day just talking about the things that they've done. So I, I can't do them all justice, but I just I want you to know that, that the level of engagement and involvement in all the committees is truly astounding. So I'm going to change gears a little bit and talk, um, I think, about wh where we should put some of our energy in the next few years. This quote uh, by Isaac Newton, if I have seen further, it is by standing on the shoulders of giants. It applies to medicine in general, but I think it really applies to surgery and, and even more so to surgery that's very technical, like hepatobiliary surgery. And we, we, we're fortunate in that we live in a time when... Um, the, the giants whose shoulders we're standing on are still around and amongst us. So, you know, Dr. Bloomgart, Dr. Langer, Dr. Bismuth are, are still around. Um, and because of that, we, we're really able to appreciate the transformation that's occurred over the past 30 years. This is a paper from Memorial that, that Bill presented at American Surgical a little over 10 years ago. 
um, describing their experience with 1,800 liver resections over the previous decade. And, and he talks in the introduction about um, a paper by Foster and Berman in 1977 where they presented a multi-center experience of 621 hepatic resections with an operative mortality of 13% and over 20% for major hepatectomy with fully 20% of those being from bleeding. And in their series, and in most series that are published now, the mortality rate is well under 2 or 3%. There's a bunch of reasons that we've gotten better at it. Um, improvements in, in technology, improvements in anesthetic technique, a better understanding of who we should and should not operate on. But I think the big one is just the development of hepatobiliary surgery as a, as a specialty with an appreciation for, for the, ana the anatomy of the liver. So I, I think that it's fair to say that we're probably training and producing third generation HPB surgeons now. So the, the first generation surgeons are still around. They're not operating anymore. The second generation surgeons who learn directly from those first generation surgeons are sort of in the prime of their career right now. And, and the third and fourth generation surgeons are, are, are coming out and, and are populating centers all across the world. Um, and we've gone really from 25, 30 years ago where there was three or four high volume good centers, um, MD Anderson, Memorial, Pittsburgh, Toronto, to now there's 30 or 40 centers that are performing high quality good liver surgery um, across North and South America. And so I think that, that, that it provides an opportunity that wasn't there 25 or 30 years ago. There just wasn't as much liver surgery being done and it wasn't being done uh, outside of three or four centers. Now you've got high quality surgery at a whole bunch of places um, and, and, it, and I think it provides an opportunity for us to ask some important questions and look at things in a multi-center way. About well, four or five years ago, Paul Karen Nicholas started uh, working in Toronto at Sunnybrook Hospital. Paul did his fellowship at Memorial and has a, a PhD in clinical trials. And Paul started, and I remember he, him contacting me and asking me um, if I was interested in being part of a, a collaborative clinical trials group in Canada. And I said, sure, I'd be, I'd be happy to do that. And I didn't expect to hear much from Paul again or for much to happen. And um, Paul, through um, the energy of being fresh and, and starting and just um, bullheadedness, really ha has pushed it forward and has created a, a collaborative clinical trials group in Canada, which, which is working. And, and at our first retreat, he had um, PJ Devereaux, who's, who's an internist from McMaster and really a master at, at, at huge clinical trials, come and talk to us about the value of collaboration. And, and I, want, I borrowed a few slides from PJ. So he, he asked us a few questions. He said, I want you to consider two hypothetical randomized clinical trials, evaluating a new treatment to prevent myocardial infarction, both placebo controlled, the outcome is myocardial infarction, identical methodology, concealed, blinded, complete follow-up, intention to treat, both high-quality trials. First trial's got 200 patients in it, 100 in each arm. And in the treatment arm, you've got one event. In the placebo, you've got nine. It gives you a, a p-value of 0 0.02. The second trial, 4,000 patients, 200 events in the treatment arm, 250 in the placebo arm with the same p-value. And he asked us, you know, do these trials um, mean the same thing? Do they move you away from equipoise uh, equally and, and, and incline you to change your practice to the same degree? And then he, he went on to talk about um, small variation in hypothetical trials. If you add two events to the treatment groups, what happens to the p-values? So in the first trial of 200 patients, your p-value becomes non-significant very quickly, 0.13. So it's got a fragile p-value. In the second trial of 8,000 patients, the p-value remains significant with no change, 0.02. So they developed this, what they call fragility index for treatment group with the smallest number of events, the minimum number of patients in the group who would have to change from non-event to event to reverse statistical significance. First trial, it's one, it's one event. Second trial, nine events. He then uh, went on to describe how they'd, how they'd gone back and looked at a bunch of high, high, highly cited um, trials in leading, journals, in leading journals and then looked at subsequent publications looking at the same question and found that not uncommonly the subsequent trials contraindicated the original trial. And similarly, the original trial often had exaggerated effects. 
And when they tried to figure out what the reason for that, the only, the only sort of factor that they could find was that the outcome of the initial trial had a very small sample size. What's the goal of randomization? I think we all know what it is. It's good to state it, though. It's to achieve balance of prognosis between the tr two treatment groups outside of the investigational intervention. And you want st to balance prognosis, you want to look at um, all the risk factors that might affect your outcome. So with myocardial infarction, you, there's nine big independent risk factors. The prevalence of these risk factors can vary from 18 to 65 percent. Risk factors have substantially larger associates with myocardial infarction when compared to your intervention often. An example of this is smoking with an odds ratio of 2.87. So it's not difficult to understand how, especially in a small trial, um, you may get an imbalance in risk factors despite randomization. Whereas the size of the second trial minimizes the likelihood of meaningful imbalance in risk factors that could explain the result. Good example of this is beta blocker use in perioperative patients. The original sort of trial that, that got everyone excited about it was 112 patients, had 11 deaths, two in the beta blocker group and nine in the control group with a significant p-value. When they went and repeated the trial in a large way with, with the POISE trial with over 8,000 patients, 226 deaths, 129 in the beta blocker group and 97 in the placebo group. So a reversal of the findings of that original trial. And that original trial changed, changed behavior uh, until poise was done. So I think the takeaway messages are that there's great fragility in, in small trials. You need large sample sizes to ensure reliable results, which means you need collaboration. It takes a village to raise a child, and it takes a planet to answer a good clinical question. We've talked about, about a collaborative clinical trials group before, and, and there's a good appreciation how difficult this is going to be, but it's not impossible. And I think that, that uh, Paul really, um, you know, drove that home for me. Paul is very junior. He just started. Um, and, and just with uh, force of will and energy, um, he was able to create a, a collaborative clinical trials group and within four years has, has got a, his, his first trial up and running, the HELIX trial, hemorrhage during liver resection, tranexamic acid trial. So although it's going to be difficult and there's going to be a lot, of, a lot of roadblocks, it's not impossible. It can be done. So in the past, in the past year, we've, we've put together um, a, new, a new committee, clinical trials committee, and um, spent a lot of time talking to Mike D'Angelica about it. If there's anyone that, that's more passionate about this than me, I think it's probably Mike. Mike's a very uh, pragmatic guy. He, um, he's, he's also uh, very thoughtful and, and knows everyone and, and really wants to make this work. So we've put together uh, a committee in, in the past six months, and this committee really has um, a very sort of potpourri of people with divergent skill sets that I think will address all of the potential issues and roadblocks that will come up as they work towards first identifying the first trial to do and then, and then carrying that trial through and, and, and hopefully running it through the association. It's not to say that, that, that small trials aren't worth doing and I think that, that at the outset there probably will have to be some small trials but the, but the future and the goal here is to, is to do large, multi-center, randomized clinical trials that'll, that will truly answer important questions. And I think that, that, that we, we're gonna, they're going to need our support. We have to put our support behind this committee and behind Mike and, and really um, help them get it over, o over the top so that, so that it works. Part of uh, the success of, of that committee, I think, in the future is going to be obviously funding. And so it brings up the foundation and the importance of the foundation and, and what Scott, uh, Scott has done and what Bruce Shermer is going to do as he takes over. And, and is a big part of the reason that, that I encourage everyone to, to really support our foundation because I think the foundation is going to be key to getting this committee going and, and, and helping them get peer-reviewed funding uh, in the future. So I'm going to put this picture back up again just to, just to highlight the fact that this is definitely not our association. Um, we, we're not stuck on a single path. We're very agile and mobile. And I think that, uh, that this, this boat represents us much better. 
I, I need an excuse to put a picture of my boat up. Um, <laughs> And I think that, that, it, that it really does uh, represent what we're capable of. So I want to thank, thank you all for the opportunity to serve as your president. It's been my honor and privilege. And, and most importantly, I want to thank the people that are most important to me, my family and my, and my two daughters. Thank you very much.